now. Um, questions and answers. Again, uh, the panelists can comment on each other. Uh, questions can be addressed to specific individuals or to the panel as a whole. Okay, I have a question. <laughs> um, in that, uh, maybe mainly for Professor Polite, but uh, for the others as well. Um, it was um, interesting to hear the um, all-pervasive corruption as a uh, phenomenon from the, uh, the state. Um, and it seems to me that we as libertarians or, or Austrians, um, as long as we don't tackle this corruption, we will be like hamsters in a wheel, uh, in, in effect. Uh, so um, even, as you said, uh, it will lead to hyperinflation. Looking at Germany 23, the hyperinflation didn't stop the corruption. In fact, it, it just uh, sent it another way. How can we start tackling the corruption? <laughs> Thank you very much for, for the question. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, I, think, I think last year I, I put out an article uh, titled Fiat Money and Collective Corruption, and the idea was to identify an explanation why there is a recurrence of the boom and bust cycle. As you may all know, Mises always said, well, people don't understand the workings of the monetary system. So once uh, an inflationary boom goes into a bust, they would consider even more money and even more inflation as, uh, as a remedy for the malaise. And um, I was wondering whether this really is the only explanation and as an economist, you would always think about economic incentives. And so I came across the idea of calling it collective corruption because um, it's not only the banking or financial industry that get hooked by a fiat money system, but also the users of, of money and fiat money denominated bonds, uh, those who benefit from government handouts, etc. And um, yeah, as you, as you rightly say, the, the, the problem is really uh, collective corruption. I think uh, uh, at the moment it's really difficult to, you know, to make a case for, for a change in the monetary system. Um, the acceptance for, for change is, I would say, fairly limited at the moment because many people would obviously expect to benefit still from such a system. And um, to be honest, I, I, uh, I, I, I on the back of this explanation, I do not really see uh, that by political means, so to speak, uh, a change can be brought about. Uh, I think what Mises had in mind, the, the ultimate catastrophe uh, of the fiat money system is really um, the driving force for change. I would, I would like to make a quick comment on that question. Uh, one of the ways that we can um, Rid, rid ourselves of, of, of this whole plutocratic um, interlocking between the banking system and the government is by dealing in cash. That is, uh, having, have a movement, start a movement in which people are urged to pull their cash out of the banks. Now already European countries are suppressing the use of cash, Sweden, Italy, and others, because they're dreadfully fearful that any attempt to use cash will undermine the power of the elites. Okay, uh, they're, they're using excuses in Italy like, well, you know, this is a way of attacking people who don't pay taxes. And in Sweden, they're, they're, they're stressing the efficiency argument. And in the US, they're stressing the, the, the drug war and white collar crime. But there's more to it than that. A, a mass withdrawal of cash from the system will bring it down. Okay, will not just bring down the fractional reserve banks, but it will bring down the other firms, uh, the primary dealers. Uh, 30 primary privileged dealers in, in um, U.S. Treasuries. Uh, and so the whole thing, uh, this is a, a way of the grassroots, the people on the ground striking back at the elites. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of that. I would like to make one additional comment to this too. Uh, yes, of course, that would be a great idea, um, but that might only make the system continue as it has been going in the past. Again, the big crisis will break out, and how do we solve the crisis then? Um, so more fundamentally, I believe, uh, we have to attack the idea of, of democracy, because democracy, of course, 
leads to corruption uh, of the entire mentality of people. Everybody can vote themselves the property of other people. Uh, this is the beginning or the, the foundation of this entire corruption uh, that people have the ability to think uh, if I vote for this I can just get the money of, of somebody else as long as we do not attack the root uh, of this corruption, I think we will never get rid of it. Uh, it might seem a very difficult task to do, but uh, this is what I have set myself up as my, my personal task to try to delegitimize the idea of mass democracy. That is the root cause of all of this corruption. I have a question here. Um, a question for Thorsen. Um, you said that um, um, you know fiat money tends to lead to hyperinflation, and uh, I think that's the majority of the opinion of us Austrians. Uh, but uh, weirdly enough, uh, that hasn't happened in Japan since 1990. N the Nikkei was at 39,000. Today it's less than 9,000. They have been printed. They invented QEs, not the New Zealanders. Japanese invented the QEs, uh, and. and and they, they have been doing this massively uh, over the last 20 years. And nonetheless, we don't see any inflation. Might be the case that the, the system is delivering at the same time that they are creating new money. The system wants to deliver whatever they created in the past QE or something like that. So I would like to, to hear your opinion on that. And just one quick comment uh, to Joe. You said that the banks uh, uh, would be foolish uh, to lend 30-year mortgage or whatever, but we have in the private market uh, companies issuing perpetual bonds, for example, in which perpetual, perpetual bonds, in which you know the investors they don't expect to get their money back, just the interest rates, uh, and, and even worse than that, the perpetual bonds usually are callable, so the issuer can call the money back, uh, uh, the bond back, if interest rates uh, go uh, lower or against them. So that's just a quick comment. Yeah, thank you very much. Your question uh, refers to the situation in Japan. And I would say uh, Japan hasn't been inflating at all. In the last 15 years or so, the money stock M2, as a representative uh, commercial bank money aggregate, grew around about 2% per annum. But the, base the, base money, the base money hasn't been expanded drastically. The balance sheet of the Bank of Japan, for instance, has basically remained unchanged since the middle of 2006, where it has tripled in the euro area, for instance. Japan hasn't been pursuing an inflationary policy. And all I could say is they could, they have a fiat money system, they could create hyperinflation in six seconds, but they haven't done so. The Western world is pursuing a completely different strategy at the moment. Japan hasn't joined the effort so far. And uh, let me just, uh, as a final remark, say I very much agree with what Professor Hopper said. The, the fiat money system is just a symptom of democracy. And so I think it's, it's very important to stress the fact that the root cause, you know, if you, if you have uh, problems with fiat money, I mean, you, you have, if you think about it, you really end up in, in majority voting. With respect to Japan, the yen actually appreciated against most other currencies, so that seems to be an indication that whatever inflationary policy they have conducted it is uh, uh, less than what we have seen in uh, other countries, otherwise we couldn't explain uh, this uh, quite systematic appreciation of the Japanese yen. But they have a QE policy that I think includes not only buying uh, governments, treasuries, and, and, or the equivalent in Japan, but they're also buying ETFs and they're buying REITs. So, uh, and say what you will about whether the Fed is involved in that market in the United States. If they are at this point, it's, you know, clandestinely. But the, the open policy of the Bank of Japan is buying everything but, you know, rusty, you know, bicycles. So, uh, I mean, they seem to be at least trying to uh, implement uh, quantitative easing, uh, possibly to no effect. Okay. 
So my question is to the panel, but I'm addressing specifically something that Guido brought up in his talk related to the uh, phases of government imposed money. Uh, as most of you are probably aware, starting on January 1, 2013, in the United States, gold is going to be reclassified among the U.S. banks as a zero-risk asset equal with cash in U.S. Treasuries. Also on that date, uh, the Bank of International Settlements uh, Basel III agreement will kick in, which will recharacterize gold as a Tier 1 asset as opposed to the Tier 3 asset, which means that it goes from a 50% haircut to a zero haircut. What this means is that governments, obviously, and by the way, the reason the OCC, uh, FDIC, and the Federal Reserve issued this memorandum to U.S. banks back in June was in compliance with a requirement that was made in the Dodd-Frank legislation a couple of years back, which means this has been in process for quite some time. So it, it appears to me that governments are quite aware that they need to go to this next first phase again of imposing gold as money, but not as a medium of exchange, not as a store of value, but as a bank asset and as a means of collateralization, which is the two ways in which it will be applied. Since 2009, the commodity markets throughout the world have started to accept gold as a zero risk asset equal with gold, or, excuse me, cash and treasuries. So as a collateral asset, this has already occurred. But, and it is widely used, but not widely appreciated, let's put it that way. Now, most US bankers are, as Doug has, I like to say, famously said, can't spell gold. They don't understand gold as a, anything other than a commodity, and they're very uneducated about it. However, larger banks, I think, are very much educated on it, which points to the greater centralization of banks. That's a separate issue. My question is, is since it appears that gold is incrementally starting to become part of government policy again, and it probably will not go to medium of exchange, as far as uh, I can see, except in some kind of minor reference to recharacterizing gold. How do you see this, this development, and do you see this as a significant development? I, I think uh, the main purpose of these measures is to take some of the pressure of financial intermediaries. Uh, more and more citizens, especially wealthy citizens, well, they read, tend to read articles and analyses that are published on the internet and you, you very quickly encounter some Austrian-inspired analysis, studies, and so on. And even if you're not, if you just have been raised by your grandparents and so on, and they, they know something, well, they have some part of your money in gold or something like this. Now they see that the gold price has been remained, by and large, uh, stable and even uh, significantly appreciating in, in, in the past few years. So they c consider this to be a natural hedge against uh, uh, other forms of investment, or as a natural alternative for other forms of investment. Now that, of course, creates a big problem for financial intermediaries if the customers run away and say, well, I don't want this stuff anymore. I'm selling my life insurance, I'm reducing my bank account, and I go into gold. Please tell me where I can buy gold. You can, you can sell me a safe deposit, or I will rent a safe deposit from you, but I don't want to have this uh, uh, investment alternatives anymore. Now that's a problem for them. And before financial regulation made it impossible for them to offer gold-related, gold-based products. So now they will have the possibility to attract at least a part of the customer base that is running away from them, they're really running, and, and, and keep them. Uh, and as you, I, I don't think that this is a move toward gold as uh, uh, a medium of exchange, at least not in official policy, I and mean, some people have uh, raised this idea very, very cautiously. Right? There was uh, Robert Zellig uh, two years ago was uh, the president of the World Bank. He said, we, we need to think about ways of giving uh, gold uh, some, some role in the international monetary system. Well, some role, right? So, some mythical uh, <laughs> relation, but no, no, no effective role, right? So 
Yeah, so I think it's, uh, this, I, for me, this seems to be the main significance of these measures. I don't see anything more. And I don't see that uh, this will uh, uh, really attain uh, the, the ultimate objective. More will follow. Yeah, there's a, this is the, there are unintended consequences. Uh, the unintended consequences will likely be that people will, in larger numbers, recognize that gold should be held as cash. Even though the central banks do not like that something like this uh, occurs, but by driving up the price of gold, more people will recognize that might be the way for me to go personally also. Uh, so the intended and the unintended consequences are not exactly the same. The unintended consequences, I would think, will go in the opposite direction of what the planners are planning. I think there is, uh, to be somewhat cynical about this, uh, J.P. Morgan actually uh, advertised um, 18 months ago or so uh, to be actively taking gold as collateral uh, to make gold loans. Uh, if it is reclassified uh, in the way that Michael has uh, suggested in his, his question, uh, the amount of reserves uh, that banks would have to hold against that loan would come down significantly making it much, 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 much more profitable for J.P. Morgan to lend significant amount of money against gold. I don't think your average community bank is making a, uh, any loans against gold. Uh, I remember the day when I got a call up at my office from uh, the, a junior lender downstairs, and she said, I've got somebody who wants a loan against these, uh, these uh, Kru, 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 I said Krugerrands. <laughs> And uh, I, she said, oh, is that what they said, Kruger ends? I said, yeah. Are they any good? <laughs> and uh, so I had to talk her through that. Uh, but I think J.P. Morgan has a sophisticated enough uh, and institutional enough uh, uh, business clientele that uh, to go out and advertise that they're making gold loans against gold collateral is significant. And the fact that Jamie Dimon is on the... Uh, you know, and on, on board of uh, one of the Federal Reserve Banks that's going to have a decision making power in instituting this uh, makes me think this, this is going to help uh, one of his lines of business. Maybe another thought. I, I think the revolution starts not in the payment, uh, the market for the means of payment, but it starts in the market for the store of value. Yeah. People will keep uh, fiat monies for doing their day-to-day -day purchases in the supermarket, grocery store, etc. But they will move away, increasingly so, from investing their lifetime savings in fiat-denominated bonds. And that, that is where the revolution has started already. And the second remark I would like to make, the collateralization issue which, which has been brought forward. I mean, at current prices, at current prices, the, there's a fairly small stock of gold. F consider, for instance, uh, I just have, have the number. Uh, the Deutsche Bundesbank is the second largest holder, so it is said, of gold. It's uh, 3,400 tons. That's around about 107 million ounces. Current market prices, at current market prices, the value is 120 billion euro. It's, it's very small. And for instance, the total balance sheet of all banks in the euro area is 34 trillion euro. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's nothing at current prices. Okay, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Pollight a question and the rest of the panel if they want to answer as well. Um, we've had a, a pure fiat monetary system since 1971. That's more than 40 years. Um, how close do you think we are to flipping into hyperinflation? Uh, and what, how do you think it's going to resolve when it happens? As you know, you're an Austrian. We don't know the timing, <laughs> uh, which is a pressing issue, of course. Uh, I, I, of course, I cannot give you any scientifically based uh, estimate, but I think we are we're getting closer. And I would say maybe two, three years, it will be faster than most people expect. When you, <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be messy. <laughs> I, 
I want to speak to that. Um, what I think will happen is if hyperinflation does threaten to break out, if we get galloping inflation, um, I think at that point you will see wage and price controls in the United States or, or so-called incomes policy uh, in, in Great Britain. I think they will begin to in, implement what Nixon did uh, back in, in the early 1970s. And I'm very fearful of that. I'd rather have open hyperinflation than to have government control, repressed inflation, as it was called, during World War II. And I think that's a very real political possibility in the United States. OK, my question is directed towards Professor Hülsmann, I guess. Um, since you were talking about the uh, precious metal markets being manipulated uh, by interested parties, um, I'm a bit skeptical about that because if you look at the mid to long term picture, say charts of the last five to ten years, the bull market is pretty much intact. And uh, as I understand it, in order to really make big moves in however narrow or wide a market, you need to actually sell or at least offer for lease physical bullion. And uh, if this scheme uh, should have been going on since, I don't know, conventional wisdom has it is, uh, since the late or 90s or mid 90s, all the gold should have been gone to, into the investors' hands, or shouldn't it? So you want me to comment on this? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. So there's never probably any, any conclusive evidence that you can come up with for, for gold price manipulation. I think personally that the circumstantial evidence is very, very strong. And especially as far uh, uh, resulting from uh, central, former central banker uh, pronouncements on the issue, for example, um, uh, Kevin Walsh, who has been a Federal Reserve uh, Council of Gov uh, Governing Council board of, uh, of governance uh, member, uh, has stated in two or three public appearances that uh, some of the main activities between, main, uh, between central banks concerned gold swaps and also activities therefore with, uh, with, with private banks. So why should this, I mean, if, if you look at the, at the typical manual for, uh, on monetary policy, you will not find this among the policy tools, right? The policy tools are always uh, re repurchase operations, uh, buying and selling treasury bonds and, and, and stuff like this. It's nowhere gold swap, you don't find any mention of this, but that's what they do. What we don't know is the exact quantitative dimension of the whole thing. So we don't know to which extent they've been bearing on the gold prices, but we know for sure from such pronouncement, uh, pronouncements and other circumstantial evidence, such as there's no as great reluctance to engage in any uh, audit of uh, the Federal Reserve and, and Treasury holdings uh, of, of gold stocks, uh, that, that it is very likely that they do this. And again, I think for, for me the crucial consideration is the one that has already recently expressed by Martinson, to whom I've already referred to, you, that he said, well, the, the central, our central banks are concerned about managing virtually all markets, every single market. Right? We do, to some extent, we're living in a centrally planned economy. Why should they not be interested in the gold market? Uh, this is absurd to think that they might be interested about uh, bond prices uh, in, in the whole spectrum, right? F from two-year bonds to 10, and not interested in the gold price. This is just ludicrous. They've been, even, uh, they've been buying even stock, uh, stocks, right? And so they, they do all these things and not, not gold. I mean, right, again, I might be wrong. I admit this is a, this is a logical possibility, but I would... Uh, say that right, the, the, the probability that I'm, I'm, that I'm wrong is close to zero. Uh, I have a complimentary question to Torsten about the situation or the example of Japan. We have the uh, European Central Bank lending Lots of, I don't know uh, the exact number, but lots of uh, euros to big banks. And after months, it came out that banks have put, uh, deposited it back to their uh, 
the ECB account. Can you comment on that? Yeah, thank you very much, Murat. Um, as you know, in a, in a fraction reserve banking system, banks keep just a fraction of their liabilities in the form of base money. In the past, it was 2%, meaning a Euro area bank having a liability in the form of side deposits of 100 euro kept 2 euro as minimum reserves. And these minimum reserves were held with the European Central Bank or the National Central Bank, which is part of the, the whole thing. Nowadays, uh, banks can no longer refinance themselves via restructuring their liability, uh, their liabilities, which allowed them to keep a very low fractional reserve. The, the central bank now fills the gap. It basically refinances all the bonds which banks can no longer place in the capital market. So it's a 100% refinancing of their liabilities. And the consequence is that the so-called excess reserves increase so drastically. And so it's a, it's a matter of fact, so to speak. It's quite natural that in the, under the current monetary policy making, banks' excess reserves increase so drastically, and these bank reserves are being held on accounts with the ECB. So it's, it's, it's it, so to speak, of course, it's, it's a wrong thing, <laughs> but it's, 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 a, it's a matter of fact that you have the, the drastic increase in excess reserves. No, because I thought the banks should lend it further to the public, but they wouldn't do it. So the general uh, price level in uh, Germany or Europe does not go up yeah. as expected. You are absolutely uh, is that because yeah. the banks are afraid of yeah, uh, being unsolvent. In textbooks, typically, you would, you would see if the central bank increased the base, the base money supply, you have a constant multiplier, and so banks would automatically churn out ever greater amounts of credit and money. The availability of base money is one necessary condition for banks being able or being in a position to extend loans. The other condition is the equity capital base. And nowadays, banks have run into big, big trouble. The equity base is gone. Many banks do no longer have the adequate capital to back up their risky assets. Uh, private investors are no longer willing to recapitalize these banks. And so at the moment, central banks increase the base, but the, the, the increase in the base doesn't translate into a higher amount of credit and money. And now you think this is going to end in deflation. Well, there is a different channel through which the central bank can increase the money stock. It can, buy, it can purchase bonds. And for instance, if it starts purchasing bonds from so-called non-banks, like insurance companies, private savers, it sends the newly created funds directly on people's accounts held with Citibank or other big banks or small banks. And you have an immediate increase in the available money stock. You get your inflation once people <laughs> wish to create inflation. During the Great Depression in the 1930s, uh, it was also the case that despite the fact that the money supply was, base money supply was drastically increased, you did not see much inflation taking place because banks were fearful and simply uh, increased their own reserves with the consequence that you got the impression you can increase the money supply and no inflation will result. But this is just a temporary phenomenon. Uh, yeah. and as soon as a little bit of confidence returns, or uh, as Torsten just said, uh, as soon as uh, bonds are bought up, uh, that then you will see rapidly increasing inflation. And, and currently in the US, uh, what Han says also holds. Um, on the one hand, the, the um, Fed pays 25 basis points for the excess reserves. And give that, uh, given that, in the face of the fact that we have very, very low returns on safe investments, the banks have no, no incentive to lend. And, when, and you add that to the fact that the Fed has been keeping asset prices up, so why would that you lend against what are overvalued assets as collateral? 
So, but as confidence returns, and I think it can only return if, if, if you allow asset prices to fall to market levels, um, I think this money is going to begin to flood out into the system. And I may add uh, to, 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 the, to just what has been said, you assume, or many people assume, that these monetary policies are meant to stimulate the economy, uh, to create jobs. But maybe you're wrong. Maybe it's a deliberate attempt to debase the currency. Or just to pile on some more, uh, the, uh, the month that uh, unlimited deposit insurance was, insurance was put in place in the United States, uh, called TAG, that was the same month that uh, the Fed said they would start paying 25 basis points. So suddenly you had big banks who uh, could offer their customers unlimited FDIC uh, insurance if you get no interest, then the, the bank can turn around and put their excess reserves at the Fed for 25 basis points. That doesn't make sense if there's a lot of loan demand, but it does make sense if the loan to deposit ratio in the banking industry is 70%, which it is now. So it's just a direct subsidy to the banking industry uh, to try to heal themselves uh, and try to play the market until things get better. One more question to Guido. Uh, we all well know that uh, the monetary system uh, doesn't matter what the path is going to be, is collapse. And then a new money should uh, be chosen by the market, I hope. And uh, why has it uh, to be gold? Can it be also a free market electronic money like Bitcoin? What's your take on it? I, I don't think that uh, bit, bitcoins could become money right now. I mean, there's a bitcoin uh, community. Uh, uh, people are very enthusiastic about this idea, and there are no, have been no negative experiences with either. And they assure us, yes, I mean, uh, it's it's as good as gold because you have all the advantages of gold, and uh, but not not the disadvantages. It's not bulky. It's it's electronic, so cost efficient, and so on. Well, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether it's really cost efficient, and I'm not sure whether it's, it's that sure. Right? Necessarily, it's made by human beings. Uh, it's anticipated in the system that under some circumstances you can create more units. Right? So somebody is authorized, because if, if you don't, if you just keep uh, the, the current uh, supply, then you get very, very strong price deflation as soon as uh, Bitcoin spread. Right? So somebody must be authorized to create more, I suppose. So somebody has the keys to the whole thing. So which reason do we have to trust those key masters more than minters of gold coins? Well, I personally, for me, this is, is clear, right? I, but I wish everybody else had good luck. <laughs> I, I, go ahead, buy bitcoins and uh, sell me your gold. <laughs> go ahead. About bitcoins, you, you always get these sorts of questions in emails that people send you. How do you think about this and how do you think about that? I mean, you get far more questions than you would ever be able to answer. Uh, about bitcoins, I always ask people, can you explain to me quickly what bitcoins are? And then I typically get such complicated answers that I think, who in the world would ever want to hold something that that an intelligent, decently intelligent person like myself cannot understand. <laughs> yeah, I have a question for Jose Lerner. Uh, whatever, uh, whatever else one might say about Paul Krugman, one has to grant him the fact that he's exquisitely skilled at exploiting a serious problem that we laymen have with economic theory. Uh, and that is that it's very easy to promote economic error with plausible platitudes. But it's very difficult to expose this error. It requires painstaking analysis and, and, and dissection. And he uses this problem to, 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 to very great uh, effect. You, you mentioned one example in, in, your, in your talk. A more general one is his dismissal of any free market um, theory as free market fundamentalism, um, which flies in the face of facts. Uh, for example, um, 
he, he describes those who worry about the deficit. Uh, it's nothing to worry about. We are, we are just inflationistas. Um, uh, we just ignore the, the, the fact that um, none of our predictions have come out right. I mean, there is no inflation. According to us, there should have been inflation. There is no inflation. Um, there's no rise in interest rates. Um, the U.S. government has no problems uh, accessing the capital markets. In fact, there's a flood of, of, of capital into, into, into the U.S. My question is, given this disparity, the ease with which it is, or with which, which, with which one can promote economic nonsense, and the difficulty with which, which one has in addressing this nonsense, how can one win this debate? Let me just add to that. Um, yes, Krugman's disingenuous, and he doesn't, you know, he speaks out of both sides of his mouth. But he's doing nothing different than, for example, Bernanke did when he for the first went on television on 60 Minutes. I you yeah, yeah, yeah. Bob, just answer, and, and he sat there and, 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 and bald faced and said, no, the Fed doesn't print money. <laughs> well, literally, that's true. They don't, the Fed does not print the notes. That's the Bureau of, Federal Bureau of, of Engraving. So they'll use these little tricks, I'm just adding to what you're saying, uh, to, to, to mislead and disorient the public. Now, as, as to how to expose them, I think, I mean, the Henry Hazlitt's strategy, I think, is, is what works. That is, Hazlitt wrote in a very plain, straightforward way and translated their ideas into, you know, everyday English or everyday uh, language. And I think then was able to explode or demolish it. And I think that's what we're trying to do at the Mises Institute and here and, 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 and at many other free market institutes. Um, that is to, to render the ideas just clear, clearly, because you see how silly they really are, that pieces of paper can get an economy going. So what, I'm, what I think where the lack is, is that there's a lack of people doing it. And I think that, or, or people noticing it. So I think just more education and um, more, more free market bloggers. And you know, it, I think it's, it's a question of quantity at this point and not necessarily quality. I think we have the way of answering their ideas. And I think it is, it is very Im important in, in these replies to people like Krugman that we don't get involved in technical details but ask them questions almost like a child. It, explain to me how the increase in paper pieces can possibly make a society richer. Uh, if that were the case, explain to me why is there still poverty in the world? Isn't every central bank in the world capable of printing as much paper as they want? And do you then think the society, the world as a whole would be richer? I'm sure the guy cannot answer this type of question. Nobody can answer this type of question. Um, but again, we get far too much bogged down in answering technical details of his argument instead of always repeating this question. Please explain to me how a piece of paper can make society richer. I have a question to the entire panel. And uh, even in Sweden, we have a grassroots movement for against taxation. And as in many countries, people get upset. Taxation is very easy to explain. As you talked about, kids are very smart, and my daughter, she understood both taxation and inflation when she was five and got very upset, of course. And it's easy to explain taxation. When you meet people, you have to learn that it's theft first, of course, but then we talk about inflation. People tend to zoom out. Even if we think it's a very easy concept, inflation, but for most people, it's very hard to understand. They don't get too upset. And in Sweden also, the central bank has this 2% inflation target, and they write on the homepage, it should, it's no exact science what inflation should be, what level, but uh, the people must be unaware that it's happening. They actually write that. I email them and ask what, what happened if they are aware of it, but they didn't reply. But I think here's maybe a key to if people would be aware of this, because the central bank knows if they would, they wouldn't accept it. So how is more question of strategy? How can we make this grassroots movement happen against inflation, 
in the same way as you can do in taxation. Well, one of the uh, things that I would say is that, uh, and Hayek stressed this, especially if he won the Nobel Prize and he really went on the attack against Keynesians. Uh, and, and he said, look, the reason for inflation is that the short-term benefits are highly visible and you know, the people that receive the new money um, are wealthier and at the same time you, you have a lower interest rate so there's more borrowing and, and so you do have a, a false prosperity. The people who have not yet received the new money, on the other hand, will not feel the, the, the pinch of inflation uh, until later on in, in, in the um, cycle, a year, 18 months, whatever, you, whatever the let me, Friedman's lag, so-called, is. But at that point, the government can say, well, it's really uh, these greedy um, uh, Arab sheiks that you know, want, want high oil, oil prices, or it's a failure of the, the food harvest. Uh, so there are many excuses to explain the longer run effects. So you are right, it's, it's very difficult to trace through the effects if, if you're not an economist. But again, using the Hazlitt strategy, I mean, I think there's a simple way of doing that. Uh, you know, Hans is, uh, you know, they print paper, um, and if this paper can buy things, the people, people who get the paper first are going to get more real goods, and there's going to be fewer real goods left. So, you know, making those sorts of of responses, I think, is, is one way to go. In most cases, people just don't care, okay? They don't care until either one of two things happens. First thing is that the inflation rate becomes substantial. Then people become nervous and sometimes very angry. And then they start looking out for explanations why the hell are you doing this? And who's responsible for this? And so on, right? So then we have uh, a foot already in the door and we can get the message across. The second circumstance is, and that is what happened in the US and in some European countries, is uh, the, the revolting subsidies and bailouts granted to the financial industries, in particular banks. So then people too become upset. It is morally revolting. And, and so then too, we get a uh, foot into the door and that is why today, uh, there is a Ron Paul movement in, in the U.S. It was very strongly inspired by bailout policies in the, the fall of 2008, which on, on top of this he had announced and uh, anticipated. And why this also to some extent has happened in, uh, in Europe, especially among people interested in, in financial questions. I think there's no way getting around explaining what inflation is I think the problem starts if you accept the mainstream ec economics uh, definition of inflation, like rising consumer prices. You have to tell people that inflation is a rise in the stock or the, in the quantity of money. That's number one, because if the quantity of money increases, the purchasing power of a unit of money will decline compared to a situation where there's no increase in the quantity of money. And the second issue is you have to explain that increases in prices are just one symptom, one possible symptom of a rise in the quantity of money. And the second aspect I think you, which needs to be explained is, is, really, um, is really, uh, the Cantillon effect. Telling people, those who receive the newly created money first are the, are the great beneficiaries, and those who receive it later or receive n nothing from the new money balances are the losers. And so, you know, you can refer to the current situation. Ask your, your friends why, for instance, just banks get a rise in the quantity of their money balances, and not all of them, all, all people, right? There must be something to it, a reason. But, but again, I think if you, if, you, if you accept the mainstream economic definition of inflation, you're going to lose the battle. Again, I think simple, simple explanations are always the most effective one and also are the ones that drive home a moral point. So for instance, you can explain, imagine, you tell your child, imagine you could just in your basement print uh, $100 up. Um, would that be good for you? I think it would be great. I, 
can buy something. Um, and then you would ask, then you ask the next question is, do you think society as a whole gets richer of, because of this? No, the, he would really say, no, I, I, I will be better off, but society will not be better off. I have now more goods and other people have less goods as a consequence of that. And he will recognize that that is, that that is just fraud, ridiculous thing that is going on. And this sort of stuff goes on every, every day. Um, hello, I, I, I've got a question for the panel, I suppose starting with you, Guido. Um, over the last 30 or 40 or 50 years, hyperinflations have become more common and they're normally associated with crumbling political regimes, which makes you rather worried about what's going on in Europe. And the boom-bust cycle seems to have accelerated in the last, say, 15 years and also grown in magnitude. But even so, collapses and crashes are relatively rare occurrences and the total and complete purging that many Austrian economists dream of has probably never really happened and it's therefore rather an improbable um, occurrence. So I suppose what I'm asking you is based on probability is some kind of muddle through not more likely than some kind of collapse? Well, I, I agree that we're not... I, well, first of all, I agree that uh, hyperinflations are relatively rare, especially in, in, in countries where you have, you have some uh, civil control over the government, so it's, it's, it's not completely out of, out of control. Uh, it's not that rare. I, I think we had, so far, we had 56 hyperinflations in history, and short of three or four, all of them were in the 20th century. So in the 20th century, it, it was quite a frequent uh, event, especially after World War II, again. Right, so it's, and so far it's true in, in, the, in Western Europe and in Northern America, we've been spared this fate because we, we didn't have banana republics. And the question is, are we not turning very quickly into banana republics right now? And that, that would increase the likelihood of hyperinflation. It's true, we're not yet there. And I don't anticipate hyperinflation for, for the next few years, in, in, in either in Western Europe or in Northern America. But uh, it, it cannot be ruled out because what, what's the, the, the crucial problem is always um, the government budget. Can the government balance its budget? Can it handle all those expenses that, that are being carried on without increasing the money supply? So far, we have not been able to do quite without it. And to the extent that uh, the, the, the governments had to do this, they had to increase the money supply, they did this under very uh, favorable circumstances because we were in a general economic crisis. And as a consequence, there was a flight into what is consider, generally considered to be a safe asset that is government bonds. Right? So these were very advantageous circumstances in the first place. And in the early stages of a hyperinflation, there's something else that happens that also dampens the effect of an increase of the base money, namely that financial intermediaries shrink. Typically, they shrink. Because people, if they're confronted with a, a money uh, that is losing its purchasing power very fast, they don't keep it on a bank account, or in, less and less so. So if less money is held with banks, banks can act less and less as financial intermediaries, so they have to cut back their activities, which means that they are themselves creating less money substitutes. Right? So initially, the effect of an increase of the base money supply on the price level is dampened by the negative impact that a rising price level creates on commercial banks. We are, in my judgment, at the early phases of that movement. Right. But then, uh, right, if, if you look at historical hyperinflation, it was always a parabolic movement, right, a hyperbolic right, uh, parabolic, uh, movement. So eventually, it, it, it accelerates very fast. And it, it can also, and it, it will accelerate if we don't change things fundamentally, it will accelerate eventually very fast because uh, government spending programs are not diminished, 
new financial obligations are being taken, sometimes in dimensions that we cannot uh, oversee. So it can be that the government be forced to, for example, bail out massively European commercial banks and so on. The sums that are involved are uh, in the low double-digit trillion euros. Okay? The total money supply M2 in Europe is around 9 trillion euros or so. So this, this can happen very fast. And it's true, right? I don't, there's not a praxeological law that tells us it will happen in, in February 2014 or something. But yeah, uh, I think, we, can, it be, can it be avoided? Yes, if we have the guts to balance the, the budget. But I don't see any political party who has the guts to do this. Yeah. I, I would like to, to answer the second part of the question, which may have been more implied. Uh, and that is that Austrian economists do not look forward to any collapse. In fact, we want the laissez-faire or hands-off policy precisely because it prevents the collapse. Uh, precisely because you have the collapse only if government artificially keeps prices and costs um, from falling, and asset prices from falling. So, for example, in 1920, 1921 we had a recession, a uh, depression actually. Uh, the money supply contracted by one-third, 33% within a year. Pro uh, wholesale prices fell by 50%, they fell in half. Unemployment shot up. Congress began to talk about expanding public works. By the time the debate even started, it was over. It, it took nine or ten months. So there, there was a purgation of, of these overblown sectors. So a, a, an Austrian correction isn't a correction like the 1930s, where there's mass unemployment and it's pretty permanent. Okay? It's, it, it, certain overblown sectors are forced to contract. And when prices, relative prices adjust, that's, that's what we're looking, for, for, uh, looking forward to. A, a, a correction of relative prices and, 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 and asset prices. Once that occurs, confidence returns pretty quickly. Entrepreneurs begin to borrow and, and expand and so on. So uh, that also happened in 1837, 1838. Uh, uh, and, and there's a number of other re what we might call Austrian style depressions. I have a question to Professor Salerno and the whole panel. Um, all central banks uh, claim that they can fight uh, possible hyperinflation by withdrawing uh, additional printed money. Um, maybe you can quickly elaborate on the technical capabilities of central banks to withdraw uh, base money um, or new additional uh, fiat money from the, from the system. And then I would like to have your opinion on whether this policy could be uh, yeah, a possible strategy for central banks in the situation which now, uh, which we now face. Yeah, this is a so-called exit strategy that they've been talking yeah, about. The exit strategy. Um, they can certainly sell a lot of the assets they purchased, mortgage-backed securities and so on. But if they did so, the market for those would collapse. I mean, the prices are false that they have those things on their books. You can probably um, verify that, Doug. Yes. So these are all false prices. The market would collapse. The bank, in some legal sense, though a central bank can never be insolvent, the, the U.S. central bank would be insolvent in some sense, the Fed, okay? That wouldn't stop them from continuing to print money. The other thing that they could do is that they could raise reserve requirements tremendously to prevent the, loan, the lending out of those excess reserves, which they now hold, okay? Um, I, I don't see them doing either of those things. I think they're just gonna muddle along until um, inflation is tripped and we begin to get this inflation and then, I, I, as I said before, I think we're gonna get a uh, pretty strong inflation in, in, a, in a few years, and with a strong possibility of getting wage and price controls and, and, and uh, more centralization of the, uh, of the central control of our economy. Yeah, just a point on, on selling, Fed selling its assets. I mean, they took in some of this toxic uh, paper at 100 cents on a dollar that's worth a, a fraction of that. Now, they, they got the law changed. Uh, prior, if they were going to sell those assets, they'd have to take a loss. Uh, but now they can stick it to the treasurer, uh, treasury or uh, the taxpayer, if you will. So they can sell these assets, uh, which will create losses. Uh, and, uh, you know, the thing that springs to mind is that the, the Fed balance sheet may not really be as big as it appears to be. Um, that will remain to be seen as they try to exit. But, uh, you know, as they say, there's not, uh, there's nothing... No such thing as being partly pregnant, so. <laughs> <laughs>